From the time we're little, we begin to tell ourselves stories to help us get through the day. We find excuses for our behavior, and we tell tales for our actions. I remember when I was 16 and was supposed to be at a friend's house. I came home well after midnight to find my parents frantically calling all of the hospitals in search of me. I told them that my friends and I had met some boys, and we were out late because all four tires in their car had blown out at the same time. I prayed my story would magically save me from my parents' wrath. Sadly, it did not. Many stories, however, have. As a young girl, I loved to daydream. I would stare into my desk drawer for hours, wondering what I would fill it with one day. What were my dreams, my visions, my wants, my desires? This distracted way of thinking drove my very serious older sister crazy, but I didn't care. My inner world was my happy place. The way we choose to think about our lives, the things we tell ourselves to get through the day, will ultimately determine the kind of life we're going to have. The stuff that happens to us actually is not at the forefront of importance, but what we do with that stuff is. Little did I know that my distracted way of thinking as a little girl would one day become a useful tool when faced with serious health challenges. I practiced ballet until my body let me know in no uncertain terms it could no longer tolerate this kind of dance. Thank God it's only structural, I told myself, and structures can be fixed. I handled spinal fusion and knee reconstruction like a champ. To some, I appeared to be a superwoman. To me, it was no big deal. I just did what I needed to do. At 36, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. This was a whole new ball game. Although I had worked in palliative care for eight years before my diagnosis, everything I learned there quickly disappeared as I became a neophyte in uncharted waters. I did what I was told to do. There was no reason to question the doctors or the decisions. I trusted them fully. All I wanted was for someone to take me by the hand to give me a pill, to make it go away, and to make me better. Cancer is scary as your mortality is literally in your face. Unlike my previous surgeries, this was a big deal. I had, after all, what the docs called the ultimate failure of my body's immune system. I remember my mother telling me, if you have anything that you ever do, do it to the best of your ability. I guess ultimate was a good thing. Medically speaking, surgery and chemotherapy would leave me 95% chance of disease-free living. But once my treatment was over, what then? I was miserable, uncertain, vulnerable, and I cried at the drop of a hat. My happy-go-lucky nature disappeared. On the deepest level, I understood that we cannot just remove a tumor and expect everything to be perfect. We are not, after all, just physical beings. Our emotion and spiritual needs need to be addressed if we dare hope to be healthy. The doctors did what they could to heal my physical body. It was up to me to deal with the rest. I remember a quote from Nietzsche who said, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. My kids were my why but I needed a structure to figure out my how. I needed to create a foundation, a path, and then fuel it with purpose and with passion. My first goal was to live long enough to see my children graduate from high school. And next, I needed something desperately to believe in. I guess it's true what they say, that when our backs are up against a wall and we have nowhere else to turn to, some move towards faith. I needed to believe in something intangible that no one could take away from me, and I created my own construct of God. My God kept me company in the darkest of times. My God wrapped his arms around me and rocked and held me the same way I rocked my daughters when they were small. I imagined looking into his eyes and seeing endless possibilities. This was so important to me 
because what it does was it left the doors open and allowed me to keep that flame of hope so vital to my very survival alive. There was no blame or expectations that God would heal me. That I knew would be up to me. I told myself success was simply doing my best and I couldn't get it wrong. Thich Nhat Hanh, a Vietnamese Buddhist priest, said in a Paris lecture, if at first you don't believe it, fake it. Eventually, with enough practice, you will start to believe it. The stories we create around a crisis help us get through the tough times. I chose to make up stories that gave me solace, and eventually, those, so, those stories became my reality. I envisioned myself healthy and strong. I can, I shall, I will, I am able became my daily chant. I studied, I learned, I educated myself on healing modalities from around the world. I changed my diet, used visualization, exercised my body, prayed and meditated to soothe my soul. I was not playing the wait and see game. Go home and be happy, the doctor said. Just live your life. Clearly, those words came from someone who had never had cancer. Upon graduating from the School of Natural Health Consultants, I received a diagnosis of lung cancer. I remember one of my classmates looked me straight in the eye and asked, what did you do wrong to get sick again? I told her that she asked the wrong question. What I had done right to keep it at bay for five years, and what more did I need to do? Now that was the right question. I had begun using my mind as a power tool, changing thoughts and ideas that didn't serve me well into those that made me feel better. I learned that when I was at my most vulnerable, fear led to distorted thinking. Calming my body helped calm my mind, and my calm mind led to clarity of thought. The stories we attach to, the stories we attach to that which we think will influence how we feel. That we know for certain. And even though a second diagnosis of cancer <clears throat> is one foot closer to the grave, I decided that would not be my story. Was I delusional? Perhaps. But as I wrote in my memoir, Resilience, sometimes that's exactly what we need, to be out of our minds so we can truly be in our hearts and souls. This time around with a sachet of tools and healing techniques from around the world, I was ready to be my own experiment. I was at peace with whatever outcome I would have to face. I agreed to remove the lungs surgically but forego all other medical interventions. The doctors were not at all pleased with my decision and tried whatever they could to have me change my mind. But I was not to be swayed and delved into the world of alternative medicine with both feet. I knew there was no magic bullet, but I figured that this was simply a chapter in my life and I was going to do it my way. Was I brave to defy medical recommendations? No. Did I think that somehow I was smarter than those around me? Again, no. What I do know is that just as it takes many people with different expertise to build a house, we need more than one kind of medicine to build health. My choices encouraged and empowered me. The ability to make them made me feel better. The expectation of success affects how we feel. That we know for certain. And the better we feel about our choices, the better quality of life we will have. Although those choices may not always guarantee us the outcome we would like, the hope, belief, and passion we put into them can make even the most arduous journey more bearable. Remember, we do not need to be defined by the stuff that happens to us. What we do with that stuff will create the story of our lives. As an anonymous author once wrote, everything was once and for a time a dream. The tree lies in the acorn, the bird waits in the egg, and the butterfly becomes in the cocoon. Dreams are the seedlings of reality. So I ask you, join me. Dare to dream. Dare to imagine. 
dare to believe in the endless possibilities that exist for each and every one of us. And finally, dare to write your own story and take the path upon which you choose to travel. Thank you.